So what will it take to end Colombia's unrest? Well, to answer that, I'm joined now by Sergio Guzman, who you just saw in that report. He's the director of the Colombia Risk Analysis Group. Arlene Tickner is a senior lecturer in international relations at Del Rosario University. And Marcio Manzani is the regional secretary of Uni Ameri Americas, a trade union group which aims to improve working conditions for millions around the world. Good to have you all on the program. Marcio, is the government listening? I don't think so. I think that the government is not leasing the workers, is not le leasing the Comité Nacional de Paro. Uh, the meeting was uh, the first meeting that they have with the committee, which we believe could, could drive to a good solution, was followed by a, me a meeting with the business and nothing from the Comité Nacional del Paro, the National Committee of Strike, was taking consideration in the in in the when the, the vice president speak speak to the public, and I think that's why we continue to have the strikes and the protests in Colombia. Yes, Arlene, tell me why the tax reform proposal was just so unacceptable to so many Colombians. Um, it's a regressive tax reform in the sense that it gives prerogatives to uh, mostly business. Um, that was one of the main sources of discontent. Um, but there's also conversations about a pension reform and discussions about reducing the minimum wage in order to increase employment, for instance, of youth. So it's actually a combination of, of reforms that the population is protesting against. Yes, let me ask the risk consultant, Sergio, when we look at it from Duque's government's perspective, they were, you know, very focused on unraveling Santos's deal with the FARC and the peace plan and all of that. Did they take the eye off the ball on the more bread and butter issues because they were playing politics? Well, in a way, the government's political agenda has been the first thing on, on the docket. And unfortunately, that hasn't yielded significant results to the government. See, they, they tried to introduce the same financial reform the first semester of last year, but they were unable to. But that was followed by the president's objections to the peace agreements, where he was unable to consolidate a majority in Congress. So even though President Duque says that he wants to lead primarily an economic agenda, his party is more focused on the political agenda. Arlene, how much is this connected to the political issue, the fact that Duque came in on a mandate to undo a lot of what Santos did before him? I think it's all connected. Um, one has to understand that um, Colombian uh, public opinion is, is tremendously divided on the issue of the peace accords. But in fact, um, the Duque government's reluctance to implement many aspects of the accords and his stalling has actually fueled um, the discontent of many sectors of Colombian society. And this now mixes with all of these other demands related from um, related to tax reforms, pension reform, um, reform of you know working laws, education, um, amongst other issues such as inequality. So I think we're seeing a combination of factors lending themselves to um, many different sectors of society taking the streets to protest. Marcio Monzani, is is this something that's about more than just tax reform for you? That's that's for sure. I think that's not only tax reform. I think that the history of Colombia is involved on it. On one hand, that we have together with Brazil, Colombia is is with Brazil the most inequality country in our regions. We have a people that leave to work at three o'clock in the morning, arriving in their homes at 10 p.m. and and earn less than minimum wage in Colombia, and that that's not sustainable. That's not sustainable. On the other hand, it's about the history of peace. So mm. when Dukes decided to not implement the peace agreement, he made he made a statement. He told that he's not in favor of peace. And that's a wrong message to the people. That's a wrong message to the world. And for those, Marcio, who say that this is um, an example of contagion, where you see the Colombians taking, drawing their inspiration from what they've seen on the streets of places like Chile, are you inspired by that? Yeah, of course, we are inspired by the protests. I think that the right to people to stand and to say what is wrong for them, it's positive. It's positive in Chile, it's positive in Colombia, it was positive, it's positive in, in, in Ecuador. I would, I would make a difference about in, uh, Bolivia mm -hmm. when we have a coup d'etat, it's different. 
but the, the people is now in the street is speaking that they do not agree with that. But I think it's positive just to see the people that they don't want those change. They are they are fed up with the situation. They don't want to see the situation like Colombia that we have the top two two people to the top two of the population earning 98 percent of right. the health of the count they don't want that anymore they want distributions they want inclusions that's that's the message um, and sergio guzman if diego molano or even president duque himself called you in and said okay how do i fix this what would you advise them to do well, I think they need to pick on the low-hanging fruit, the things that are politically feasible for them to do uh, and that, that fit in line with what the opposition wants. So I'll give you four examples of what they can do. First, they can reduce the salaries of members of Congress. Even though that sounds silly, it's a very symbolic move. In Chile, 50% of salaries for Congress were reduced, and it was a unanimous vote done by Congress. The second thing they could do is directly dialogue in sincere efforts with the strike committee, like Marcio was saying. I think that the government has tried to make very broad the, deba the debate and the discussion, and that's taken away a little um, of, the, of the agency from the people who are protesting. I think the, thir the third thing that I would do if I was the president, I would really concentrate on the anti-corruption points, on the anti-corruption consultation points, which is a unifying factor in many of the people's anxiety and many of the people's frustration. And finally, the fourth thing that I would do is I would start a commission to investigate uh, abuses by the authorities and by the police to the strikers, because that is one of the things that creates a unifying narrative among many of the people who are going out. That entices them to go out to vote and to go out to the streets even more. Right, a, an 18 year old was actually killed by a police projectile. I'll into the point of direct dialogue. Um, from the outside looking in, it seems as if Duque has handled this in a very corporate way. It's bringing in the stakeholders to have a sort of corporate discussion about this. Do you think he's lacked heart in directly reaching out to people and saying, hey, I'm here to listen to you. I want to know how to fix this. Uh, most definitely. He is one of the most unpopular presidents that Colombia has had in many years. Um, and he's only been in power for a little over a year. So I think there's um, a lack of authority, a lack of legitimacy. But I also think there's a lack of political will, as we've already heard. Um, he's called in different sectors for a conversation. He's actually um, intentionally not referred to dialogue, but conversation. Right. And to me, this means that we're not talking about a discussion among equals, but actually you know, a discussion between the government, which has an agenda um, that it's trying to impose on the protesters. So I think what he has to do um, is to step down from his high horse at this point and actually enter into a dialogue based upon the 13 points that the different protesters have set, have set down as the beginning point of a national dialogue to try to attend to at least some of the issues that are angering Colombians, um, Colombians justifiably so at present. Yes, Marcio, there's an ugly side to the protests. A lot of reports of a xenophobic element where Venezuelans are being scapegoated by some protesters. Tell me why that's happening and tell me if you find it condemnable? Well, I think that instead to find condemnable, we need to educate people, we need to help people to understand that immigration in our region is doing several issues, that we have a poverty, we have uh, um, um, disruptions in terms of democracy, and we see people from uh, time to time to move from country to country. The Colombians are, are a country that, the Colombia is a country that we have a plenty of immigrants, uh, immigrants in the world. So I think that, in, in, of course, that we condemn any act of uh, xenophobia in, 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 in protest or anywhere, but it's important to educate. And I think that, um, even the government is created this or against them. them. It's it's the, the 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 message that we see from the government from the from the the, the, the people that this government serves that the UDBism and the conservative business people from Colombia is saying that it's us against them and that's wrong. We need to say that it's about us and we need to have a change to include our. Uh, Aline, is it um, a symptom 
of the fact that the longer this goes on, the more likely you're going to see other such problems emerge because we're seeing xenophobia against Venezuelans right now. I, I, I would have to say that compared to other contexts in which there's large immigrant populations, um, Colombia has been up until now an exception in terms of strong xenophobic tendencies. Um, what we're seeing in Latin America in general with all of these protests is the tendency of governments to attribute the protests to different types of foreign actors. And unfortunately, the, the large Venezuelan presence in Colombia has lent itself to accusations mm. that some Venezuelans were behind this. Um, I don't actually see this necessarily getting worse um, if the protests continue, simply because I guess in Duque's defense, and I would defend him on very few issues, um, the government has made efforts to try to separate its opposition to the Maduro government in Venezuela from um, the Venezuelan population in Colombia that is here, given the, the, the dire circumstances being faced in Venezuela. So I don't really see that this will necessarily continue. Right. Uh, Sergio, I don't have too much information connected to too many polls, but the best available poll that I have shows that 55% of Colombians support the strike. Tell me what that means. Yeah, no, I, I think I think it's higher than that. I think the latest CNC poll suggests that 74% of the people support the strike. But then there was another poll that says, uh, between striking and normalcy, what do you prefer? And 61% of people said, well, we, we prefer to return to normalcy. And that was a confusing question to make uh, to begin with. But what I think is people understand the reasons why others are upset because they are upset too. They don't feel that economic growth is getting to them. They don't feel that the, the, the business sector is being responsible enough. They, they feel that the government has left them behind. And I think, you know, to, to, to Arlene's point, I think that there's an important thing to also give the government credit for. In the past, a lot of governments to, to, to dispel the protest would sign whatever piece of paper was put in front of them. They would say, okay, what do you want? will make it happen, and they never really met their end of the bargain. This government is trying to really get to an agreement on something that they can achieve. The problem is that there are hardliners within the government that are constantly telling the government, you can't give in, you can't, uh, you have to push back against these protesters. And I think that that makes it very difficult for Duque to actually have a negotiating position in the first place. Right, that's an interesting point. It is the third national strike it remains to be seen where this will go and how much bigger it might be. I have to wrap, but it's been a pleasure talking to all of you, Sergio Guzman, Aline Tickner, and Marcio Monzani. Thank you very much for joining us here on The Newsmakers. <laughs>